Former New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg has officially entered the 2020 presidential race, and he's already facing attacks from his Democratic rivals. The multi-billionaire launched his campaign Monday in Norfolk, Virginia. Over the weekend, it was reported that Bloomberg is spending more than $30 million this week on ads. That's more than any campaign has ever spent on political advertising in a single week. Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren and Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders have both accused Bloomberg of trying to buy the election. Here's how he responded after being asked about the attacks today. For years, I've been using my resources for the things that matter to me. I was lucky enough to build a successful company. Uh, it has been very successful, and I've used all of it to give back to help America. I'm now in the race. I'm fully committed to defeating Donald Trump. I think he's an existential threat to our country. Um, I'm going to make my case and let the voters who are plenty smart make their choice. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor. And Scott Detrow and Dan Balls join me now. Scott is a political correspondent for NPR, and Dan is chief correspondent at The Washington Post. Welcome to both of you. Scott, help us understand where Michael Bloomberg fits into this race. <laughs> Who is the prototypical Bloomberg voter? That's a great question, and I think we're all very curious to figure it out. Mike Bloomberg is hopping into the race extremely late. He is doing the very unorthodox move of totally skipping those key early states that really define so much of the momentum of a presidential contest. Uh, let's think back to Deval Patrick, who hopped into the race about a week or so ago. Of course, he does not have anywhere near the financial resources of Mike Bloomberg, who's worth $52 billion. But Patrick was a high-profile Democratic uh, two-term governor of Massachusetts. He got a lot of buzz hopping into the race. And within a week, he had to cancel events because only two people were showing up. And that's not a knock on Deval Patrick. It just shows how hard it is to get into a presidential contest that's been running for almost a year now. Mike Bloomberg made the argument today that he can build a diverse coalition, but this is someone who, even though he got pretty high grades for the 12 years that he was the mayor of New York City, really had alienated a lot of Democratic voters in the city by the end and wasn't incredibly popular with that party. And now he's trying to hop into a race where uh, there doesn't seem to be much room for a new candidate, according to most polls, showing seven and 10 Democrats are perfectly fine with their already enormous field of candidates. <laughs> enormous indeed. Dan, earlier this month, you spoke with New Hampshire voters about the prospect of Bloomberg entering the race. What did they have to say about Bloomberg and his strategy of focusing on Super Tuesday states rather than early contests like Iowa or New Hampshire? Most of the people that I talked to, uh, and this came right in the week that uh, he made it clear that he was going to get into the race, just didn't feel as though there was a need for another candidate, as Scott suggested. There wasn't an appetite. Um, it's not that people have figured out who they want to vote for. Uh, they've spent, you know, eight or nine or ten months trying to figure out from two dozen candidates who they really like. They don't find Bloomberg so compelling that they felt the need to, to pay serious attention to him. You know, you asked who is the prototypical Bloomberg voter. I think in the team Bloomberg mind, it's the swing voter in the general election. I mean, I think that's who he believes he can get that other candidates might not be able to get. Um, but to become the Democratic nominee, you have to go after a different kind of voter, and I think that's the big test. He has plenty of money to reach people, to put his name and face and bio in front of people, um, but the path that he's chosen to take is one that nobody has done successfully in the history of modern presidential politics. So, Scott, one set of voters Bloomberg may target are those supporting Joe Biden. He's remained at the top of the polls recently, thanks to overwhelming support from African-American voters, especially in South Carolina. You just reported a piece on how Biden's competitors are hoping to win over black voters. What did you learn? It was, it was interesting. The day after the debate in Atlanta, you had a lot of candidates spe specifically targeting African-American voters. So my colleague Asma Khalid was with uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who both did events in Atlanta. And then I was with Joe Biden right about the same time in South Carolina. And we saw something that we've really seen all year, and that's a pretty interesting split between a lot of younger African-American voters and older African-American voters. Younger voters who might not be so interested in, in, in specifically wanting to vote for someone just 
because they're African-American candidate. Kamala Harris and Cory Booker are having a hard time gathering support, possibly because of that reason. But she talked to a lot of people at Warren and Sanders events, saying, you know, Joe Biden, his time has come and gone. He doesn't speak to me on the issues. I'm not necessarily impressed that he was Barack Obama's vice president. I was in South Carolina, a totally different picture, and this is what you see overwhelmingly in the polls from older African-American voters in particular. The fact that Joe Biden was with Barack Obama by his side for eight years goes a long way, and that is a huge reason why they are not only ready to support Joe Biden, but not really interested in other candidates. That support has stuck over and over again, poll after poll over the course of the year. And that's why the Biden campaign feels pretty comfortable, even though they are seeing their numbers in Iowa get a little sketchy. They feel like they've got support in South Carolina, and they've got support in a lot of the states that vote right after South Carolina. And they point out that you can't become the Democratic nominee for president unless you're the candidate who's won the black vote. Dan, if Joe Biden holds on to older black voters, but another candidate is able to make inroads with the younger subset, are there enough young voters to win the nomination? There haven't been in the past. I think that's a thing that the Biden campaign is counting on. Again, as Scott suggested, older African-American voters, uh, older voters in general, are much more reliable voters in presidential primaries and caucuses than our younger voters, and particularly younger African-American voters. Um, so the candidates who are counting on breaking through with young African-American voters um, are taking a chance. The, they're going to have to break into the support that uh, Vice President Biden has. Now, I think one question, the, the Biden campaign clearly feels that South Carolina is a firewall and that as they go into the Southern primaries, uh, that that black support will hold. Let us say he finishes badly in Iowa, uh, third or fourth. I'm not predicting that, but it perhaps could happen, and, and, and has a similarly weak finish in New Hampshire. Then I think the question is, is he able to rally that support uh, to make sure that it doesn't begin to crumble in South Carolina. That's an unknown factor at this time. The mm -hmm. Biden campaign, I think, feels confident that they, that they will stay with him. Um, but it's a little bit of an unknown, given how the polls are moving in Iowa and New Hampshire away from the vice president. Something to watch. On another topic, Dan, I want to ask about your latest piece, which looks at the impact impeachment hearings are having on public opinion in Wisconsin, one of the closest states in the 2016 election. What did you find out, Dan? Well, there's a new poll from the Marquette University Law School um, that shows that over the past month, and actually over the past couple of months, um, that um, support for impeachment has not gone up uh, support uh, or opposition to impeachment has ticked up a little bit. Um, this is at a time when the Democrats have essentially put the best case forward they can uh, for impeaching President Trump. Uh, and you would expect, if they are hoping that public opinion will move in their direction, that what they are seeing in Wisconsin uh, is not particularly positive for them. Now, these are small changes. I don't want to overstate the significance of it. Uh, but both in support and opposition to impeachment and in the question of who people would vote for when they match Biden against Trump or Warren against Trump or Sanders against Trump, what we've seen since late summer into November is that it has moved from a small lead for the Democratic candidates to a very narrow lead within the margin of error for President Trump. Uh, when I talked to Charles Franklin, who conducts the poll, he said there has been a bit of a rally round uh, effect for President Trump among Republicans, um, but in some ways a similar move, but in the opposite direction, a slight moving away for among the Democrats. So um, this is not particularly good news for Democrats. It's not a predictor of how Wisconsin will vote in 2020, but it is a sign that if Democrats are believing that they can hold the hearings, put the evidence forward, and that it will move public opinion in a notable way, so far that hasn't been the case. And in fact, Scott, Wisconsin was part of that Midwestern, uh, quote unquote, blue wall that fell away from Democrats in 2016. Beyond Wisconsin, where else do Democrats need to be watching um, when it comes to the general election? Particularly, as uh, Dan points out, you have these sort of Im almost imperceptible changes when it comes to the view of impeachment. Nevertheless, um, these are the kinds of things that uh, certainly the campaigns are watching minute by minute to see how it is that people are reacting to this.
Yeah, I think that that uh, poll and that story got so much attention because the Marquette poll is one of the best state-level polls in the country. Uh, so Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, probably the two most important states in the 2020 general election, throw in Michigan as well. Democrats are going to spend so much time there. If they get those states back, they can beat Donald Trump. Uh, a similar poll came out a couple weeks ago from another really good state-level poll, Muhlenberg College and the Allentown Morning Call did a poll looking at impeachment uh, perceptions in Pennsylvania, and they found something pretty similar to what that Wisconsin poll shows and what we've seen in almost all national polls, and that is that it's very dug in, it's very partisan. There is a slight majority uh, supporting the impeachment inquiry. That majority shrinks a little bit when it's, do you support the impeachment and ouster of the president? And all of these surveys, and NPR did a national survey recently as well, shows that there's little room for movement. The Democrats made their case over two weeks of public hearings. And uh, I think we're still waiting for some broader surveys to, to come out that, that capture the full scope of those hearings. But I think there have been very little signs that we're going to see the big groundswell of support for impeachment that would be needed to, to turn Republican senators against President Trump. All right, Scott Detrow and Dan Balls, thank you both very much.